Welcome to the Fit Click, home of the best in fitness and entertainment. Here's your host, Chris Doherty. Hey, what's going on? Chris Doherty here with you. Welcome to the Fit Click. My guest today is one of the world's most respected strength and conditioning specialists in the world. He is the co founder and at one time was the co owner of Cressy Performance located in Hudson, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles outside of Boston, five miles or so where I grew up. And um, it's one of the premier training facilities in North America and one that caters very heavily to Major League Baseball and its participants. My guest today is now the owner of Core, which is a business that he owns in Boston, Massachusetts, which welcomes a diverse array of clientele. He has been working in the fitness industry for more than 15 years and is a frequent and coveted contributor for the highly reputable publications such as T-Nation, Bodybuilding.com, Greatest, Men's Fitness, Stack Magazine, Muscle and Fitness Magazine, Men's Health, and Women's Health. I'm very pleased and honored to welcome the very talented, extremely humble, Tony Gentlecore to the Fit Click. What's up, Tony? Chris, I need to hire you as my hype man from now on. That was yeah? awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, was, that was legit. I feel... Yeah, I'm like, whoa, that's me he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really you. And, uh, you know, I also want to give you congratulations on uh, you and your wife's new edition. New Ooh, edition. Yeah, it's, uh, it's no joke. I'm, I'm actually sequestered in my bedroom right now because he's out there, like, trying to be put to sleep. So I had to come into the back, back bedroom. So it's, uh, but no, it's worth, he's five weeks old today. Wow, so, congratulations. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a ride, that's for, to say the least. I was going to say, it gives kind of a new definition to strength coach, you know, when Ooh, you have it's, uh, you know, but I will, I, I have yet to miss a workout. So it's, uh, um, we're both very proud of that. If anything, we, we're, we, we, it, it allows us to get out of the house and, and something to like de-stress to go lift some weights. So, so, so none uh, of us have any excuses then. If you can do it, we all need uh, to do Well, it. I also, I have no excuse because I also own a gym. So right. it's not like right. I, I can't get to a gym to, to work out. So, uh, but no, it's, uh, it's, it's been a ride. Let me tell so you. The most loaded question I can possibly ask you, and it's the hallmark question on the show. What gets you amped up each and every day? What gets me amped up every day is I don't want to suck. <laughs> um, I, a lot of like the people I look up to, like Eric Cressy, Mike Boyle, Dan John, those are guys, and Craig Cook. I mean, there, there's a whole litany of, of people I look up to. Um, those are coaches and people and, and humans who are always striving to, to be better, um, are humble in the sense that they, they, know, like, they know how to say or aren't afraid to say, I don't know. Um, I changed my mind on this. Um, so every day I kind of get up. I just, I just don't want to suck. I want to, I want to get my clients better. Um, and I don't, I don't want to come across as an imbecile. So, uh, that, that so hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, I mean, but you know, I think I'm succeeding in that. And, uh, that, that, I guess that's my driving, my driving force is just wanting to put out good information, get people results that hire me to do so. Um, and just help people. And then how great a name, we were talking about this or joking about this off the set for a moment, but uh, your, your last name, Gentlecore, of course, the yeah. last four letters make up the name of your business, which happens to be the most important part of pretty much yeah, every yeah. training system. Um, is it kind of a blessed thing or is it kind of, uh, you know, do you wish it was uh, like no, you said, it's, hardcore? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a unique name. So uh, it's not like it's Tony Williams or something like that. Right. So. Or um, dirty like mine. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, so, I mean, your name's cool too. I can't so. do anything with it though. I just, everybody <laughs> thinks I just want to go have a Guinness all the time. So it's, it's a unique name. So that bodes in my favor. And uh, certainly from a marketing standpoint, uh, you know, calling my, my studio core kind of implies my last name. So that definitely helps. So it's, uh, you know, we have, there's, I know when we named, when we opened up Cresty Sports Performance, I think one of the things we would like to change moving forward is not calling it Eric's name. Um, and like with, with what I did, it's like, I used my name, but I didn't. So it, uh, so it worked out well. Thank you. You got a good product placement with the hat. Too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank, yeah, thank you. I was, I, that was totally, it's, it's, it's kind of cold here in Boston. So I, like, I basically spend six months straight wearing a beanie. So it's, uh, it's like, I, 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 sh I, cl I did clean shave today, though, so. Well, see, you got the shaved head. So when I naturally yeah, yeah. lose the rest of uh, what I was invested yeah. up here, it's going to be uh, the Chris Doherty Fitness with the, with the little yeah. icon logo up there. So we'll, we'll be very matching that way. So you're a humble guy. 
when, when you first started this long road of helping others, which is what all of us do in this field, um, you know, to get better in their health and wellness pursuits, who did you ideally most want to be a hero to and why? Oh boy. Like when I first started, like you're talking like in, when I first started in the industry or. Can I just talk about the, you know, when you first knew you wanted to do this and I guess, you know, obviously now that you've been the, in the field for a while, it's probably progressed a yeah. bit and maybe evolved a bit, but I guess describe that initial process and then the continuous process. You know, it's, it's funny because when I started in the industry, uh, you know, social media didn't exist. Uh, blogging didn't really exist. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird. I grew up with no internet, like growing up as a, as a teenager in the college, there was barely any internet to it that existed. So, you know, when I first going into the industry, I, I did it for myself. Like I, I, uh, fitness was always a part of my life because of sports. So it was a natural progression from my career playing baseball into strength training. So I'd always done it from the time I was 13. So uh, it was, I always joked that cause I, I, my degree was actually in health education. I was going to become a health teacher. And the joke is I could have picked a career where wearing a suit and tie every day or a career where I get to wear sweatpants every day. With a beanie. <laughs> With a beanie. Exactly. A t-shirt, like cool t-shirts. Um, yeah. and it was an easy choice on that, on that end. Like, it's like, Oh hell yeah. I get to wear sweatpants every day and get people strong and, and work out at work and, you know, eat protein and it's, it's pretty cool. And, uh, but as my career progressed and starting meeting people and, and, uh, um, kind of networking, uh, obviously opening up Crusty sports performance at some point, uh, then it became, and, and putting myself out there, like it was my choice to start writing, start a blog, start writing for Teen Nation. Um, I mean, that, that again, it was something I just felt was a natural progression in my career. And once that started happening, I feel like you get, a, you're, you're obligated to, and you start becoming uh, an authority in the industry. Like people look to you for information. So I just took it upon myself to try to do the best I can and, 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 do, and relaying good information and sound information. And, you know, I, again, going back to my initial statement, it's just, it's like, I, I really, really don't want to suck. And, uh, you know, and, and just taking it upon myself to read and go to seminars and, and just and, and staying humble. Like, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, if anything, I just, it, 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 it humanizes you more. And it's, I think people can relate to it more that I don't come across as this pompous asshole that thinks he knows everything. So I'm willing, I'm willing to say when I'm wrong. I'm willing to say, yeah. oh yeah, it's a good idea. Like, let's try that. Or, yeah. um, you know, so and there's a lot of people that do that. I'm not saying I'm the only one, but um, I don't know. So I just think now it's like, now that I, I have a responsibility, like I have people who pay me for my, my services and my expertise and seek me out to write. And now it's on me to make sure that I, I am putting out solid information that's right. both evidence-based and anecdotal. I kind of feel like there is a middle ground there. Like I'm not, I'm not specifically one side or the other. Right. Um, I, they're both important. And I, I feel like both have credence. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, a long-winded answer, but I think I answered it. No, no, that was good. And, you know, when I had, I had uh, Mike Boyle on the show uh, for episode three way back in the day, and he said a very similar thing about, you know, when you really think about it, it's not that hard to be humble. You know, it's kind of just a natural yeah. thing, attitude of gratitude. He talked about a number of his clients um, who were very wealthy men. He said they've always just had this appreciation for what they have, and it kind of just yeah. leads more. Yeah. And, uh, and like I said, I just think it comes, you come across as more of a real person. Like you're, you're willing to admit, like willing to, like, I think failing is an underrated component of success. Like you're learning to fail well. It's like the most not, important part of success. I mean, you're going, you're going to fail. And <laughs> if you don't, if you, if you don't know how to do it well and learn from your mistakes, like, Oh, that did that didn't work out well. Um, what are you going to change? Right. Uh, then what's, what, what are you doing? Like, come on. Yeah. It's a good point. Good point. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Boyle reference actually segued into my next question. You know, if you're from Massachusetts, like I am, and you want to enter the, the performance enhancement sector or, or the strength and conditioning sector, you have pretty much, I don't want to say one of two options, but yeah, you kind of do. You got Mike <laughs> Boyle strength and conditioning, or you got Cressy performance. And Cressy performance, like I said in the intro, I didn't know it at the time. You guys were five miles if that away yeah, from what's up with that you never stopped by what's up with that i know i know i didn't call i didn't write um, 
But, um, you know, what, what was it like? You know, I, I ended up interning for Mike Boyle, Strength and Conditioning. I ended up having um, a lot of friends who have interned for Cressy and then some who have actually interned for both. What was it like, um, you know, for you and Eric going from elite practitioners into the field to elite fitness entrepreneurs who could run a high level business yeah. that was profitable and could expand. And then you actually met your primary market halfway by, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. Eric's now down in Florida working with those guys. So you've got Cressy yep. performance in Hudson, you got the affiliate down in Jupiter, Florida. What was the whole transition between professional and entrepreneur like? Ooh, wow. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a, a nice question. <laughs> I, I will, I will preface that and say that, there aren't many people who are like Eric. Um, he, he is a terminator when it comes to work ethic. Like well, that, I can't wait to have him on the show in that case. <laughs> oh, you like, we, like we, we were roommates for two years. So I lived with him for two years. Like I, I left New York, middle of nowhere, New York, moved to Connecticut to, to live with Eric, you know, which was kind of a hard sell to my parents. Like I literally told them I met a guy on the internet. And I'm moving to Connecticut. So, and I'm not kidding when I say that. Like, oh, God, that's, the number of places I can go with that. Yeah, it was. This is this. Is, it was awkward. Um, it worked out, but um, so I lived in there for two years, right? And the like, we both did our own thing when we moved to Boston. And then he and I, along with P2P, opened up Cressy Sports Performance in in 2007. And I will tell you, like, living with Eric for two years, like, there were times where I would come home from work because I worked at a commercial gym in downtown Boston. And I want, I'd want i be, I'd be wiped. Like I coached for seven, eight hours. I'm like, screw this. I'm done. Uh, I'm going to watch Lord of the Rings for the 47th <laughs> time. Right. And Eric, again, coaching at his, at his gym, his other gym where he was working, same thing, worked seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours coaching. He's writing a book <laughs> in his room. Like I, he, was, he was writing maximal strength, um, you know, and at a pretty young age. I mean, he wrote, but at that point he was, I don't know, I, I just turned 30, so he was probably 25, 26. And uh, so he, he's always had an entrepreneurial mindset. Like he's, yeah. he's there's, there's just not many people who are that tuned in with just being an entrepreneur and, and being, uh, just being just being a businessman, really. Because I, I don't consider myself a, a businessman per se, because um, there was a time in my career, um, up even when I left Cressy Sports Performance. It's like, I want nothing to do with gym ownership. Uh, I, I'm not interested in that. Because even when I was at Cressy Sports Performance, yeah, I was a, I was a business owner and I was, I was a co-owner. Um, and the three of us were in it together and we built the brand. But I was, more, I was more of the technician. I was more of the coach on the floor. And so was Eric. But then at some point, uh, you know, what we had in our back pocket was Pete, who was a businessman. Right. So he, he was able to take care of scheduling and booking and utility stuff and contract negotiation. And, but Eric too also had his hand on that. Cause he, you know, like, like a lot of entrepreneurs had his, had a hard time delegating and, uh, and he would even say that'd be one of his faults. He has a hard time letting stuff go and letting other people do it. He's way right. better at it now. I um, mean, you kind of have to be when you're, when you're fluctuating mm -hmm. between two facilities. But, um, but I wasn't, I didn't consider myself a business person at that point. So I was more of like a brand ambassador. You know, I wanted to be, I was obviously a coach on the floor and, and, and growing my brand. And that's one of the cool things about Krusty Sports Performance is that myself and Eric, when we opened up Krusty Sports Performance, we both kind of had our own little brands kind of churning in the mm -hmm. background. Like he, he and I were both running for T Nation. You know, he was obviously a little bit ahead of the game compared to me because he had already written, had like, three or four products out yeah uh, so but then as Cressy sports performance grew and you know we also use that to leverage our own little brands too as well as the other coaches there so you know and that was kind of like a smart business decision um because we being a small business you know we can't just increase people's salaries every year right, right? so helping people build their brand within a brand um, leveraging speaking engagements and building a, a, a website and, you know, doing webinars and stuff like that, using the CSP brand helps, you know, give yourself a little leverage and right. ability in the industry. So, um, you know, I guess the long answer is like, you just kind of learn as you go. Like certainly when I ended up leaving Cressy Sports Performance, it was time for me to leave. And I 
I was very nervous. Like I was scared shitless to do it. And, but what was cool was that in the months, in the few, the first few months upon leaving, I kind of knew my shit. Like I kind of surprised myself. You know, I spent, I spent eight years like listening to Eric compete, talk business and do this and do that. So um, it was kind of cool. Like it was, was kind of self uh, reassuring that when I left, like, Oh yeah, I kind of know what I'm talking about. And you know, I, I, I can do this. And you got an education. You didn't have to pay tuition for exactly. Yeah. No, that, that, that is very true. And I'm sure a lot of that's the same that goes down at MBSC too. Like, you know, the same oh. way with uh, Mike Boyle's place. Like, you know, I'm good friends with Larrabee and Kevin Carr and all those guys and, and Brandon and they, same it's the same thing like they're building they all have their own little brands under the umbrella of mbsc and um i think that's the way to do it yeah and uh um again i, I know that was long-winded but i think i answered the question uh, yeah you actually answered that question you answered my next one because i was gonna ask oh, okay. well there you go i was gonna say what was it like working with a business partner such as eric with that highly reputable brand and then moving yeah. off on your own you pretty much just summed that up yeah it, you know i mean Look certainly eric, i mean eric's Eric's been a, I mean, I'd be, I'd be an idiot not to say he was a mentor. I'm not, I owe, I, I owe a lot of, uh, um, I owe him a lot for helping me build my career. Like he's certainly, uh, from a business standpoint, and obviously he's a brilliant coach. So there are, there aren't many coaches in the world that are smarter um, when it comes to anatomy and program design and, you know, just the wherewithal uh, uh, as Eric. And, you should have um, you read his intro and tape it before I have him on the <laughs> I just have you yeah, read I'll it. I'll be his hype man. Yeah, you um, can. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, and obviously, you know, we were great friends too. So, it, you know, that's, that's, that's another thing that comes into the pictures that, you know, Pete, Eric, and myself, uh, we're, we're all great friends, you know, we're opening up the, the facility. So, um, and we all had very, uh, understanding girlfriends and wives and and uh because that that's not an easy that's not an easy uh industry to be in because you don't leave work at work right uh it's impossible you know especially now where i mean some people some coaches had that luxury like they they they're at the facility they coach for however many hours are there during the day and they go home they're done um someone like myself like that's not the case at all because i have distance coaching clients, I have writing obligations, I have my website, I have speaking engagements to prepare for. Um, and that's not me bitching and moaning about it. No. Like that, that's my own thing. Mm. But I, there, there's, there's not a day off. Like, it's funny, because there's people like today, for example, is a Tuesday. I don't go to my studio on Tuesdays or Fridays, for that matter. I, they, I, there's just, those are days that I don't coach. And people just think their days off. Like, oh, you're living the high life. You don't even, <laughs> you, don't, you don't go to work on Tuesdays and Fridays. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm writing programs. I'm writing a blog post. I'm, I'm prepping articles for whatever, for whoever needs one. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm answering emails all day. And, and, and I even say engaging in social media is part of work. Like, yeah. you know, I, what's the point of having a Twitter account, an Instagram account, and Facebook or whatever, if you're not engaging with the people who are sharing your shit right like, you know, it, it, you know just it, it really it, it, it it's amazing how when if i just like a post or if i comment on and say thank you or whatever like people appreciate that and that yeah. goes a long way like that's that's a big mistake that a lot of young coaches fail to realize is that being engaging with your social media not making it just about you you know right. is, is is a is a huge marketing uh that's a marketing tip for people right there is you know, just being something as little as that. So I think a lot of people don't realize that with entrepreneurs, especially like, even if you're not physically tangibly at the office or something like this never stops, uh -uh. you know, I, mean, I, I can't tell you how many yeah. stickies I have around the apartment of like blog ideas. Yeah. Or like, don't forget to write about this or, um, you know, that's, that's just the mentality of a writer is right. just, you know, cause people are always asking me like, how do you come up with so much content to write? Cause I, I don't really think about it, but I guess I do write quite a bit. No, no. I've seen a lot of your stuff. So I see it all over the place. The amount of stuff that I write on my own website, but then for nation and men's health and other people's stuff. And I've seen a bunch of the bodybuilding.com stuff. Yeah. Too. Yeah. And you know, so that, that is a lot of stickies or notebooks that are next to my bed that are on my desk. There's just, it's just everywhere. Like he's like, cause you know, I think even Boyle talks about that too, just having, cause you're going to forget it. Like it's so important just to write that little, yeah. 
word down or thought down. Um, but that, that's just the entrepreneurial mindset right there. What do you think? And this is, this is a little bit more loaded too. And it's actually a little bit more convoluted because you have professionals who do the in-person work. And then obviously yeah. like myself and like many of us, we do the online work. Yep. What do you think is the number one thing you see industry professionals doing wrong business wise in your opinion? Um, building a brand before they have one to build <laughs> or worrying about the, the, the shit they shouldn't even be worrying about. Right. Well, I got to get a t-shirt made. I got to write an ebook. I got to, I got to have a YouTube page and be a, be a fucking coach first. Yeah. Right. Like, like get good at that. Like coach people. Like I tell every new trainer that I talk to what, where, wherever, like you should work in a commercial gym for a minimum of two years. Like you should, you need to, you need to coach people in person before you're going to be, before you even think about doing distance coaching. Like I think any good coach that does it with distance coaching well has trained people in the past in person or, or doing more of a hybrid approach now, which is right. kind of what I do. Like right. I still, I'm still coaching 20, 25 hours a week in person. And, you know, and with my distance coaching, you know, I only have like 10 or 15 distance coaching clients. It's not like I have hundreds of clients right. and you no, know, that, but that's my choice. Like, cause I, I want to be able to travel for speaking engagements. I want to be able to spend time with my wife right. um, and now my son. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I think the biggest mistake that a lot of coaches make is being too worried about SEO and getting a t-shirt made and worrying about <laughs> likes and this and then building a brand before there's even anything to be built. Like, cause I think if you, if you're a good coach, right. And you get people results and you post videos of your clients doing shit well, right. That they're, you know, and, and then you decide to write about it, you know, over the course of a couple months or years, whatever. Yeah. Um, because I think Ben Bruno talked about this once. Like, if you if you're coaching people in person and, and getting people results and, and like you're a good coach, if you if you decide to write about that, you won't need to make shit up because you're right. doing you're practicing what, what you're writing about. So right. I think that I think that's another mistake. It's just like there are a lot of people out there worrying about growing their blog or getting published on Teen Nation or Men's Health or whatever, and they have zero experience right i didn't i didn't have my first article on t nation published until i was five years into my career right yeah. and that and i didn't get in men's health until year six i didn't train my first professional athlete till year six yeah you know? so that was five years of me working in shitty commercial gyms waking up at 4 30 in the morning training a lot of people uh until all that stuff happened right you know so and, and, and the website, I just started it because it's like, oh, I have some stuff to say and, you know, Eric's doing it. So why don't I do it? And, yeah. Um, it's a good website. I like it. It's well set up. Yeah. Thank you. Nice and, format. Uh, um, you know, and, and like that started as a very, like, I, I got a free site. Like I didn't know how to make a site. So I just got a blog spot and it was free. Like, you know, and just built that and built that. And you, built you, that. you built the finished product, how it currently looks. You did that all yourself? I didn't do that. No, oh, okay. I'm just saying like. And that's, a, that's another mistake that a people make. You're going to make me feel really bad if you made that look that good. No, on no, no. That, but that, but that kind of, that goes into what I'm trying <laughs> to say as far as like a mistake is like, that goes into that whole worrying about a brand thing. Like I'm not, I think people should start have a website or start a blog, you know, yeah. just because that's the digital age we live in now. Like you should, um, you don't need to spend money on it yet. Cause no one knows who the hell you are. Yeah. Right? That doesn't mean they aren't. So then if you're interested, just in writing one, one day a week, twice a week, whatever, and write a blog, fine. In conjunction with coaching, fine. I think you should do that. There are plenty of free websites to do that. And then I, I didn't, I think it was probably 2000, I think it was 2009 that I, I got to the point where I was like, you know what? I should invest in a professionally made customized site. Yeah. Right. Because now I'm at a point now where I can invest in myself and start and you and start generating income and revenue streams via my website. Right. So it made sense at that point, three years into having a blog and website to actually pay somebody to make one. And, you know, and all told, that as, there's been three iterations of that website that I, I hire people to make. Right. Um, 
you know that I yeah I wish I was that good to I, that was not me that made that website it's Copter Labs they and they do a lot of that's who did Ben Bruno's I think yeah Copter Labs yeah. does a lot of fitness yeah uh, websites and um you know it's uh yeah they do an awesome job I'll have to hit them up in the future I'm uh, yeah absolutely. Next time I do it, it will be my third iteration of having it done. And my yeah, goodness, yeah. have I seen the money go out? That's for sure. So we both serve um, a wide range of clients, you know, from, uh, you know, in the past, you, know, you mentioned the elite athletes to your weekend warriors, to your desk jockey. Um, every single up, uh, person out there has different wants and different needs. But yeah. what is the biggest piece of head junk, to use a Todd Durkin phrase right there? You know, uh, what's the biggest piece of head junk that you think, is getting in everyone's way of experiencing the type of success they truly want. Yeah, I think that's an easy answer. I think we live in an age where novelty is in, where people want new and fancy and what's new and what's new, what's out there, what looks cool. And there's a, there's a, I think that novelty gets in the way of true mastery of anything. So I'm not a big fan of exercise variety or programming variety. Uh, I think it's a waste of time for most people. Um, I think the further a person gets and more specifically, the further a coach gets from the basics, right? Squatting well, hip hinging well, carrying, pushing, pulling, single leg work, core, whatever, however you want to categorize movement, I don't care. Right. The further away you get from the basics, um, the more I'm going to call bullshit, um, the more my, the more my uh, red flags go up. And, uh, you know, and then, and that's when you start getting into the, into the conversation of like, you know, fitness celebrities and like Instagram celebrities and like, they're just posting videos of like weird looking exercises to look cool and get likes. And yeah. I watch some exercises. I'm like, okay, that's cool that you can do that. But how many of your clients do you think are actually going to be able to pull that off? Right. right. Like, it's cool that you can do it. Like, I get it, whatever. Um, but well, it's, you know, it's aspirational, but at the same time, uh, you know, I think, if, if you look at fitness marketing, not to take this a different way, but you look at, I mean, every single thing out there has ripped abs and stuff. And the majority of people out there just want to look a bit better than they currently do and feel better sure. than they currently do. A lot of them admittedly don't even want to put in the work or are willing to put in the work that it takes to get to that, that level. That's very true. Saying that, um, and, you know, I'm not saying aspirational is bad because I think we all need to have aspirations, but sure. Um, you know, there's a difference between inspiration and, and aspiration, certainly. Yeah. And um, yeah, to, I mean, to your point, I just think a lot of the messaging out there, I don't want to criticize my own industry, but are we really tackling the things that people actually want to accomplish and can accomplish? Yeah. And I think the basics are what, what most people need, right. right? And they need to need the basics a lot. Like, 100%. and yeah. people need to be patient. Like I'm, I'm a strength guy. Like I like getting people strong and, that, and that's kind of what most of the people when they come to me are into as well. Right. Um, via my, my affiliation with Crusty Sports Performance and my blog. I mean, the, the tagline on my, my website is because heavy things won't lift themselves. So I love it. I mean, people. I, I thought of Planet Fitness for like a split second when you wrote that. Like yeah. I, I, lift, I lift things up and I put them down. Yeah. And like, but yeah. I wouldn't but, dare compare you with Planet Fitness. But, it, but of course, I mean, but that kind of uh, breeds into what I'm about. Like, I right. want to get people strong, but it's with the basics. Like, and I think going back to that whole novelty and mastery thing, I think if more people were, and Greg Robbins talks about this a lot. He's a, he's a Cressy Sports Performance coach. Um, if, people <laughs> were more, if people were more patient, right, and, and with, with, with their progress. Like, I honestly, I think – if people just spent the amount of time, like say whatever their five rep max is on something, pick a, dead, a deadlift, squat, bench press, I don't care. Whatever their five rep max is, if they were patient enough and just, and just kept training the, that same weight to where three sets of five of that same weight became speed weight, yeah. like they're going to get fucking strong, right? They don't, they don't need novelty to, to make that happen. They just need to do the same movements a lot. And I'm not saying this doesn't go into the discussion of like, using accessory movements to address weaknesses and technique flaws or like using like the suspension trainer increased stability which they yeah like i'm not saying that doesn't count yeah. like i i mean i'm all for using other movements to build body parts and muscle mass yeah. where we need it and like whatever like i'm not saying you can only do three exercises and that's it but you know i don't i don't feel people need as much variety as they think they need mm -hmm. and that's that's where a lot of people make make their mistake right gotcha so I mentioned in the beginning that you're a very 
highly in demand contributor to a who's who's list of publications. Uh, you've mentioned T Nation and uh, I've mentioned bodybuilding.com. And, um, you know, the one thing I noticed right away, because I've, I've read a bunch of your stuff and I really like it. And it's part of why I, part of why I invited you well, on. Well, thank you. Thank There's you. lots of reasons I invited you on, but, you know, that's one of them. And, um, you know, the one thing I kind of noticed right away was your tone when you write, you know, even with topics that can be highly technical, it's a very conversational, inviting, and almost self-deprecating at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, I even like in your email, like when it says, click here, ooh, that tickles, you know, like, <laughs> like it makes you laugh, but it's like, oh, I, like, I, I feel like I can talk to this guy and whatever he has to say, he's going to turn a scary lift into something that I can actually handle. Where did this writing voice come from? It took a lot of time. Like, uh, I think the be to give credit where it's due, a lot of that, a lot of the best piece of advice I got when I first started writing was, was from T.C. Luoma, the, the chief editor of T Nation. So I submitted an article or two, um, and, he always, and he told me, like, listen, like, I like what you have to say. I like your tone because I, I, there was, there was inklings of what you were talking about right. in, in, that, in that original stuff. Um, cause I basically just write how I talk. Like that's, that's what I do. Right. And, um, and he's like, people want to be, people want to be informed. Like that's what this site is about. Um, but they also want to be entertained. Right. So, and that's even more, and that we're talking, that's back in like 2006, 2007. Yeah. It's even more imperative now, um, to keep people's attention uh to have a voice and have a style um but that's come with time like that that certainly took me a lot of years to hone and get better at by just doing it um but yeah like i purposely try to be conversational and funny and put in like poop jokes and movie references and talk about how like cute my cat is poop, poop um, jokes never get old it's funny <laughs> Yeah, they never do. They never Especially do. in our community, and, like they uh, always just like with 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 performance. It's always like, you know, it's yeah. like ass to grass. I mean, but think about it. Like it's always an illusion there that never, never people perk up and pay attention. But if I'm gonna be, but I mean, if I'm gonna be talking about like you know, for more acetabular impingement or how to improve upward rotation of the scapula right. or or whatever, if I'm gonna keep people's attention, uh, you know, I gotta figure out a way. That I. I guess, I mean, I, I kind of came natural in me to do that, but it's definitely taken a lot of years of just continuous writing to get really good at it. Um, and uh, and I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that it comes across that way. So to hear you say that, uh, that it comes across as conversational and that it keeps you engaged. Uh, I wrote down three of, the headlines, th three of your headlines that just spoke to me right away. Like, uh, obviously, there's a popular show called The Walking Dead. You wrote one called The Lifting Dead four yeah. surefire ways to kill your weak points. Like that's, you know, rather than the technical hip hinge components of deadlifting, which only people in our industry would want to read, you now have led the way, oh, he's got a, 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 an interesting way to improve the deadlift. Well, yeah. I've always wanted to improve my deadlift. You know, you also use numbers. You'll say like four strength goals for a beautiful body. Um, everything so you know about point. corrective exercise is wrong. Oh, that sounds controversial. Let, let me check yeah, it out. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and a lot of a lot of those I got to give credit to the to my editors. <laughs> I can't I can't take full credit for every single title, but um, but yeah, like people like numbers, like they want to know what they're getting themselves into when they when they yeah. read when they see an article title. So if you tell them like, hey, I'm going to give you five tips on how you can get stronger or how you can improve your squat, uh, they know what they're getting themselves into, um, and then that goes into the whole conversation of readability of a post, like. You know, I wrote a post earlier last year or later last year that was pretty popular on the readability of a blog post. Like, yeah. well, but yeah, it's one thing. It's one thing to have like really good content, but it's another thing to keep people engaged. And you know, the more white space, the better. And like, how you you know, not having really long paragraphs and where you add pictures. There is a little bit of a a science to all that stuff. With yeah. that, that I just learned through trial and error. Like, I didn't read like some special algorithm that told me to like place picture here and yeah. stuff like that, or be funny here. And that's another thing too, as far as like humor, if you're not, if you're not funny, don't worry about it. Like, yeah. you know, you can be the super sciencey geek guy, you know, and, and write about, there's a, there's a market for that. People want to read about research and they just, they just want the content. And you um, can always be self deprecating too. If you have a sense, always, of you can always, always, you know, you know, I make it, fun of myself all the time. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, 
yeah, that, that, I, I love talking about that stuff, though, as far as like, you know, <clears throat> fitness writing and writing in general. Um, but I mean, first and foremost, like, I, I don't really consider myself a, a writer per se, like, I'm just a coach who happens to be able to write coherent sentences. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's R- it, writing coherent it, sentences should not be underrated, because there are a lot of people out there who uh, can't. Write yeah, I, I the, the amount of emails <laughs> I get, you're, you're very correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I was going to say, I, I think the point you make, and I, I'd love it if you would, um, for, for the sake of both myself and the viewing audience, just uh, divulge maybe a little bit more about what have you found to be the science of blog posts? Um, you know, I, I, I occasionally will watch a show called Bar Rescue. Okay. I barely drink alcohol. I don't really go to bars, but for some reason, the show and John Taffer is very interesting. And one thing he talks about regularly is that there's a real science behind how do you get people to spend more money? How do you get people to stay longer? How do you get people to decide for your bar instead of your competitor? When you look at blog posts, you know, what have you found to be the things that make people obviously catchy headlines and things you've mentioned, but get people want to read, get people to read the entire thing and get people to want to come back and read whatever else it is you have to share next. Um, I think, you know, good actionable content comes first. Um, I think over, that's the thing too, is people are just impatient. They think they're going to, they're going to start, their website and start their blog and just people are going to like gravitate yeah i feel honestly i feel sorry for a lot of incoming trainers and young trainers and coaches now because you know i don't know where i heard the the quote but it's very relevant today where it's never been easier to get your stuff to get heard but it's harder to get to get to get to get attention yeah Yeah. so it's never been easier to get your stuff out there and get published but it's it's much harder for for it to actually get read and well, I think it goes to your point about building the brand. That's the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's the thing is like, I started writing in 2006. Yeah. Right. So 10, we're going 10 plus years now. Um, I've written over 1900 blog posts. <laughs> like that's just for my website. I could go into my dashboard. Right? I know for a fact it's over 1900. Damn. And, and that's not including all the other articles I've written for other sites. That's, like, that's a few a week. Yeah. Well, I mean, I probably, I probably publish three, four or five times a week Wow. Um, on my site. And then, so, and then there's probably an additional 100 articles out there that I've written for other publications and websites. So um, that that's important. And that's just about consistency. So if you're not going to be consistent with it, then don't fucking worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, and, and the consistency can be different to different people. Like, I'm not saying every, in order to be relevant mm-hmm. in order to get to re, have your stuff read that you have to publish three, four, five times a week. Right. It could be once a week. I mean, look at Pete Dupuy, right? So his, his, he's business director of Crusty Sports Performance. He started a website a year and a half ago, close to two years now. Um, his niche is business, right? Fitness business and, and getting relevant information with that. He writes once a week. But right. it's a damn good blog post once a week. Right. And people expect one good blog post a week from him. Right. right? So that, that's, and he's consistent with that. Um, it could be two for some people. It might be three, like whatever. Like, so you, you have to be consistent with some kind of schedule. Like that, that I think is rule number one. And then if you write good content, eventually it's going to be read. Like it's, it, 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 no, I mean, someone's going to share Hey, like I share people's stuff all the time. If I like it, I'll share it and share it with my, my audience. And my social media audience isn't insignificant. Like I feel like right. I, have a, I have a lot of people <laughs> follow my stuff and they trust that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share um, uh, relevant, valuable information. So um, I just think really just consistency is really all I can tell people. That, that, that's, that's, if you're not willing to address that and make that a thing, then – Worrying about everything else is, is, is going to be irrelevant. I think consistency is one of the most important words in the history of the world. Yeah, anything. I mean, that could be, you can, you can, you can, it could be, you know, being the world's best dolphin trainer. I don't know. What the fuck? Like, the number one reason people are not in shape is consistency. Yeah, it's, it's consistency. Number yeah. one reason. There's no, there's no, you know, you could do any great workout once or twice. Why not do some variation yeah. every single day, half an hour or less? Yeah. You know? And then, you know, and then to add on to the, since we're on the top of the writing, 
you know, I think too, you need to read a lot. Um, and you need to read people that you enjoy reading. Like, and I'm not saying it has to be fitness related stuff too. Like, yeah, there are fitness writers that I like to read. Um, but there are other authors outside of the fitness realm that, that I like to read as well. Right. And, you know, you, you get a better appreciation for other people's style and how they structure sentences and how they write. And, um, and that helps, that helps shape and mold yours too. Right. I'm not, I'm not saying plagiarize, <laughs> but, but there are, there are people out there that advocate that, Hey, if there's a writer that you like, whether it's Kurt Vonnegut or, John Romanello or Lou Schuler or John Steinbeck or JK Rowling or whatever, right? It's not a bad idea to just copy what copy something they wrote just to get a feel for what it feels like to write that. Yeah. And and you you get a better appreciation of their style and their flow and their wording. Um, you know, and then reading books on writing. Like I love that. Like I love yeah. if if you want to get good at any craft, whether it's brewing beer whether it's whatever, like you should read on the topic. Yeah. It only makes sense. <clears throat> and um, There's plenty of books on my bookshelf. Like I have plenty of training books, right? But I have a lot of books that are just on the process of writing. And right. they're not like super hoity-toity, uppity English grammar books. <laughs> they're literally books about writer, like Stephen King's On Writing <laughs> on writing is awesome. It's just basically him writing about his writing process. And it's, it's brilliant, yeah. right? Um, and there's, there's Bird by Bird by, by Anne Lamont is one of my favorites. And uh, I mean, there's, there's a whole host of books on writing that just, that's just writers writing about their process and how much of a clusterfuck it can be. And I love that, I love that word. I get in trouble for it, but I love like that. Like there are writers out there. <laughs> what, clusterfuck? Yeah. It's considered very controversial. Yeah. No, I, it's, it, I, th I think people take it the wrong way. Sometimes I'm like, no, it literally is like this, you know, it's not some other, you know, nefarious yeah. connotation. Um, but <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. You said that I just and, yeah. But it's like everyone, like, and you know, I, I joke about, it. like I told you 10 minutes ago, I don't really consider myself a writer, Yeah. but, it, but it, it's ironic for me to say that because a big portion of my living is based off writing. Like I make money writing which is cool like for me to say like if i told my 11th grade english teacher that i'm that i make a lot of my living writing she'd be like what are you talking about like <laughs> like like i could go back into like high school and be like if you if i had a time machine and told myself like hey dude you're gonna be uh you're gonna be actually a pretty good writer you know when you get older i would have been like yeah whatever dude like <laughs> i want to watch goodfellas or something but right um but yeah i think you you need writing didn't come easy to me like I, I could I remember when I first started dating my my wife you know writing 500 words was torture to me it would take me forever and my writing process still is pretty slow so yeah. you know there's guys out there that can you know I don't know if it was Adam Bornstein or, or John Romanello like they literally can just do a massive brain dump right 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 and yeah. then go back and edit but yeah me, I'm like sentence by sentence right it's painstaking how slow I write sometimes um I'm a lot faster now, of course, but th that took practice. I mean, that yeah. took, I'm only like, I've been writing since I, again, like 2006. And I, I only feel just now that I'm kind of sort of starting to like get kind of good at it. Yeah. Same thing, same thing with coaching in the fitness industry. Same thing. Like I kind of just feel like I'm starting to know what I'm talking about. Um, it's you sound like John Berardi. We, it's we've experience. Had yeah. Well, well, it, it, you know, it, it, his whole thing, I don't know if you watched the episode, but he was like, you know, I really feel like we underestimate how much in its infancy stage the fitness field is. Yeah. You act like it's been around forever. Um, no, it really hasn't. Not in terms of the stuff we're talking about. I mean, you know, not, not to talk about certifications, but I mean, the, uh, the CSCS has only been around since 1985. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the way in which we talk about these conversations, it, it's a progress and it's a continuum, but it hasn't been going on for that long. No. Um... Yeah, and it, and you see it changing all the time. I mean, you can go on Facebook and see, like, if I if you did a comparable of like five years ago or ten years ago, and people talking, you know, cardio is stealing your gains and you shouldn't be running, and like the first thing ever to now, where it's pretty stupid to tell people not to do cardio. <laughs> like, it's not gonna it's not gonna suck your muscle. It's not gonna make you weaker until it does. I mean, you know, that that that's that that always interests me. Yeah.
So why do you think it is that a lot of people out there would like to have a better body, would like to yep. perform better, would like to feel better, but they seem to be comfortable in misery? And I, I know that sounds a little dark, but you know, the fact of the matter is if people want to change instinctively, that means they're not thrilled with where they're at. But conversely, they would almost rather stay where they're at and not take action and put forth the marginal amount of effort it would to change. You know, why do you think people have that like duality complex and want to change, but don't want to take the action to change? Yeah, that, that'd be a good question for my wife. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she, she's a psychologist. She could probably speak more to the, the mindset of that. But um, I think a lot of it, you're, you're, you're kind of referencing people who are hurt or maybe experiencing pain when they exercise. No, just... I'm mentioning actually a very large segment of the population. People, yeah, yeah. Who say, people you talk to every day that say, ah, oh, you know, I'd, I'd like to take some of this weight off, but it's like, they'd like it if there was a magic wand. They don't really sure. want to put forth the effort to actually remove that loose, you know, midsection, um, you know, from their body. You know, why do you think it is that a lot of people kind of like, kind of want something? But, but don't, you know, is it just strictly priority or is it just, do you think it's something deeper for a lot of people? Because some people, it's let's face it, it's a matter of life and death for some people. It's definitely deeper. Like, I think it's, I think there's no easy answer to say, yeah, they, you know, I think it's lazy to say that they're lazy. Right. You know, like I, I, think, I agree with you. I think, I think that's a, a woefully short-sighted and narrow-minded way of thinking about it. Um, because some people just don't know any better. Like, you know, a lot of times it is just a matter of like that one initial um, step, you know, going for a walk or showing them how to gobble squat or showing, I mean, honestly, like my job as a coach, when I have somebody kind of fitting that description when they come in, I want to show them success. Yeah. So if I can immediately show them success on day one, like, you know, you know, I see a lot of trainers when they work with new uh, clients or potential clients, they, they hammer them on day one. Yeah. Right? They make them super sore. And of course they're not going to want to come in because yeah. the they think they think I'm going to feel like this every single time. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, of course I'm not, I don't want this. Are you crazy? Um, so I think a lot of it is, is on, is on our end in the fitness industry to pump the brakes a little bit and just be like, okay, what can I do on day one that's going to show them success? Like, say I'm dealing with an obese client, right? This comes up a lot. I get questions a lot on you know, training obese clients. And, you know, people don't think about this, but like, say you want to show somebody how to foam roll. For an obese client, getting down on the floor and getting back up off the floor is pretty arduous and kind of a pain in the ass. Yep. Like, it's not easy. So don't do it. Like, maybe just use the stick instead. Yeah. Like, standing so they don't you don't they're gonna the less the less likely you embarrassing them uh <laughs> is 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 gonna bode in your favor and they're gonna be more receptive of things moving forward i've so, had that exact situation that you mentioned. oh yeah yeah i mean i mean i think and that's it's something that a lot of trainers don't think about right mm -hmm. you got to think about what's really what what is cool because my wife would be a good person to ask this but you got to figure out where they are yeah on, on the 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 trans theoretical model. Like, you know, some people just aren't ready to train five days a week. Maybe they're ready to train one day a week. Right. Right. You got to start there. Maybe yeah. it's two, but then you try to figure out, okay, what kind of momentum can we get going to get them in one more day a week? Yeah. Or, um, you know, and you know, some people are only going to the gym because their doctor told them to. Yeah. Right. That's going to be a little bit different scenario than, if they're coming in on their own volition. Right. right? So there, that's another thing that you got to factor in. So um, there's definitely a, a psychological component to that and um, learning in that initial intake when you're interviewing, uh, you know, when I do an initial assessment with somebody, it is kind of like, a, I'm not interviewing them, but I, I do ask a lot of questions and I try to get them to do most of the talking. Um, and I think you, you, you kind of learn like where they're at, like, you yeah. know, maybe, uh, why are they there? Like, why do they feel like they need to look a certain way? Where is that coming from? Um, you get, you get a little bit more insight onto, on, into their mindset and that's going to help dictate, uh, the programming moving forward. I mean, part of the reason I asked was we talked earlier about, <clears throat> you know, the entrepreneurs, how this never stops. Yeah. Like I literally spend most of my day and, uh, this isn't depressing in any way, but I'm like, 
how do I reach, you know, how can I be a hero to more people? I'm always thinking that. I'm like, how can the system that I've designed online, I know it's great, but how do I make them experience it? Yeah. Feel how great it is. I don't want to just tell somebody how great something is. I want them to say, wow, I can actually do this. I'm yeah. not, even not embarrassed, but yeah. I, can, I can do this and I can do it consistently. Yeah. I think, and that's, yeah. that comes into, I mean, even if someone doesn't own a gym, Right. right. Even if you're a personal trainer at East Bumblefuck, Nebraska, <laughs> right? Is that a, by the way, is it a Boston thing, the Bumblefuck thing? <laughs> oh, is it? I don't know. Maybe I don't I'm know. Making... I feel like it's only people from Massachusetts I ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> we just have potty mouths. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, we're, we're very, um, well, I'm from Mass. But even if you're, even if you are a personal trainer at a commercial <laughs> gym, you still are an entrepreneur. Right. Right. For a lot of, for a lot of people in that situation, it's up to them to generate clients and, you know, kind of keep them in, in, in their little circle. Right. So, um, you know, treating your clients that you, that, that you give a crap, right. That you are like, I mean, honestly, like looking your client in the eye when they walk through the door and saying hello is, is actually a, a part of being a businessman right. and, and it actually is a way of, of building a rapport with your client. It isn't just about sets, reps, exercises when, with, in this industry, like, Right. Half of what we do, we are kind of like um, psychologists to some degree and therapists. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so, you know, just, just like greeting your client with a smile. Like, hey, how you doing? How did uh, – I, I remember you saying you're going to go see that movie. How was it? Or how's your wife doing? Or whatever. Um, that goes a long way, and you're building that rapport. And then, again, the, I think the programming – that's a whole nother conversation, but the more, the more you're able to show people success that they can and showing them what they can do and not what they can't. Um, Cause that's part of the assessment too, is I'm so sick and tired of, of uh, trainers going too deep down a rabbit hole on, on making it their mission and initial assessment to show how dysfunctional right. their clients are like, Oh, we got to fix this. We've got to fix that. You can't do this. You can't do that. Like, yeah. Again, what kind of precedent is that setting, yeah. right? So um, you, you so and Pat Davidson are hitting a lot of similar points. Oh shit! Well, you know, well, yeah. I, I will thank you. Like, I feel I, I, I'm, I'm proud of myself that I'm on par with him. But oh, no, no, he uh, said numerous times. He's like, too many times we're trying to, you know, I'm not denying that there aren't problems in the movement system, but like, think about things that a client can actually do and benefit from right now. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than yeah. trying to diagnose everything and then get all it's, it's so, complicated like, and piss them off and, or upset them, you know. Yeah. Like, what's the uh, point of telling somebody that, you know, oh, your posture's bad, right? Like, they probably already know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so don't even say it. Like, you might, you might write down your little note or whatever. Or if like, you're going to say it, write a Tony Gentle core type of article, four ways to very quickly fix your posture. Yeah, or that. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's, much, that's a much uh, nicer tone. Um, <laughs> we'll but, have you write it too. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Pat. It's just, it's, it's really from day one, if, whether someone's in pain, not in pain, uh, motivated, unmotivated, uh, showing them what they can do and what they can do well, um, and just being uh, uh, a positive uh, influence um, goes a long way. So, Tony, you've co-founded a highly successful business with Cressy Performance, as we discussed. You've started another one on your own that you're currently immersed in. You do all this writing. Uh, yeah. You know, everybody wants you to write for them. And, uh, you know, when I first asked you to come on the show, you almost felt like you didn't belong. And when, oh, I, wrote yeah. that, by oh. when I wrote that, I put a big LOL next to him. I'm like, is this guy crazy? Like, uh, he doesn't think he belongs. Clearly you belong heavily. Um, what's next for you? Um, and, and, you know, what, what is your next conquest to solve in this well, entire racket? You know, now that I, I, I joke for years, I didn't want to be a business owner. And here I am a business owner. <laughs> um, but I, it, it was kind of like a, a comedy of, of, of things that happened that it just kind of fell in my lap. So, right. but it's worked out well so far. Like I have, it's, things are going great paying the bills, making money. Like it's awesome. Um, you know, now that I have a newborn and, uh, there, that there's that to come in the equation, I think, you know, I hope to expand core, maybe, you know, see what, see what that takes me. But, um, you know, I, I definitely love going around the world and the country and speaking. I think that's such a huge honor that, uh, people want to listen to me talk for 
you know, let alone one hour, they want to listen to me talk for like a day or two. Like that's always, you know, kind of surreal to me. Um, you know, I can pull it off thankfully, but it's, uh, you know, th there's going to be that. And I think, honestly, I think the next thing is going to be me, uh, doing a, uh, you know, I have a couple things in the works as far as like more fitness products, um, coming in 2017 and 2018. So basically it's continue doing what I'm doing now. Um, and just working more efficiently, not so much more, but just right. still working and, um, you know, still writing. I, I enjoy doing that and just trying to stay relevant and not being an asshole. And, you know, people, people will hopefully still follow me and read my stuff and everything will be well. <laughs> well you sound like an entrepreneur to me. That's for sure. Well, I appreciate it. You know, we'll see, uh, you know, maybe we should have a, another, another, another interview in a year and I'll be like, Oh, that's horrible. Like, I, um, I, I would love to have you on again. It's like, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm hosting my own fitness version of like the tonight show where it's like, yeah, come back and see us again soon. You know, like, yeah, well, it's, I, I, I love talking shop. So, um, uh, you know, I do, I do I, as, as humble as I come across, like there's, there's a degree of, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. And I feel like I give good insight and information, but, um, you know, it's just about paying it forward. Like I, I've had a lot of mentors myself and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be mentored to other people. So it's always cool. Well, I've had 32 guests on the show as of today, and I've learned something, you know, special myself from each and every one of them. I mean, I learn from the show. Everybody who gets to watch this learns things. So, I mean, I think when you are consistently fortunate, like I've been to have really the best in the business on the show, that's just the natural byproduct. And that's very special. So I really appreciate you coming on today, Tony. Well, thank you for including me in that mix of wonderful coaches. That Absolutely. You well, it, it was an easy choice. So uh, Tony Gentle Core, <laughs> the owner of Core in Boston, Massachusetts. You can check him out at TonyGentleCore.com. And uh, you can, of course, observe his fine literary works on Bodybuilding.com, T Nation, yeah. the entire uh, who's who list that I mentioned at the outset. And you can check him out on his social media, which is uh, listed above in the graphics. For Tony Gentle Core, I am Chris Darty. Please check out all episodes of The Fit Click on Facebook, on iTunes, on Instagram, on YouTube, and of course the podcast. Uh, did I mention iTunes? Yeah, the podcast on iTunes. And uh, like I said, for Tony Gentlecore, Chris Doherty, we'll see you next time. Thanks. For all episodes of The Fit Click, check us out both on iTunes and YouTube. Connect with Chris and his guests by liking the Chris Doherty Fitness Facebook page and by following him on Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter using the Chris Doherty Fit handle. 